Great to be with you again today. This is our last chapter in our first evangelism manual that we have. And this chapter is called Answering Tough Questions. And I sort of feel guilty when I say that because we're really not going to get a chance to get into really answering them. This is more of an introduction to them. And this is something that we're training and equipping people all the time at Ambassadors for Christ. And we do several times a year training on apologetics is what we call it. It's how you defend your faith, how you answer some of the tough questions that people are going to throw at you. And I'll tell you one thing that we're, we're wanting to do is actually develop an apologetics training manual where just like I've been doing with this one, we're going to make some training videos and uh, help you to really be able to give a great answer for any question that you might find or any question that you might be asked. In 1 Peter chapter 3, let me read a verse of scripture to you. This is verse 15, again, of 1 Peter 3. The Bible says, Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give an answer. Or really, the word is apologia, a defense, to everyone who asks you for the reason, or a reason for the hope that you have within you. And yet do it with meekness and fear. <clears throat> it's important to realize that people, they have questions. And the truth of the matter is, many lost people have good questions that need a good answer. And if we will prepare ourselves to give a defense or to, to give an apologia, an apology. It's, we're not apologizing for our faith. We're defending our faith. We're giving people a, an answer for the reason that we have the hope we do in our hearts. And that's what Peter is telling him. Now, I want you to think about this because it, it's very important. God wants you to be able to answer their questions. It's not enough just to say, well, you need to take it by faith. There's a lot of people that don't have faith. And if I don't have any good answer for their questions, all I'm going to do is confirm their unbelief. Think about that for a minute. My job is to do a little bit of study, to do a little bit of thinking, to do a little bit of praying. And to come up with a good answer so that when people ask me why I believe in God, I have a reason and I have a, a, an answer for their question. Now, if you'll notice on, on page 66 of your manual here, I've listed that there are three main ministry contexts. By that I mean there are three main ways or, or areas that you're going to find yourself in if you're doing ministry. The first one is going to be in the Christian church world. Now, just think about it. If I go to a church and I preach, well, that's, that's one group of people. But what else do we find? Ministry in the secular world. These people don't believe the Bible. They don't believe everything we believe in church. There's a third context. And again, all I'm going to have time to do today is sort of highlight these. And that would be ministry in the world or the arena, if you will, of world religions. They think completely differently than people do here in the West. Reality to them is completely different. And again, in each of these contexts, we need to be prepared and understand the basic presuppositions that people have. And again, this is an introduction to sort of stir you up and to whet your appetite for some things that if you study these, you'll become much more effective in sharing your faith. Now, the first context is ministry in the Christian world. Let me just give you a quick rundown. People believe in the existence of God. They believe in the virgin birth. They believe that Jesus died on a cross for our sins. They believe in the resurrection from the dead. They believe in the inspiration of Scripture. They believe that God has revealed a plan of salvation. See, all this is in the church world. 
They believe in eternal life and either heaven or hell. They believe in miracles and that there are real answers to prayer. And why do I mention all this? Because in the second context, ministry in the secular world, they don't believe any of that. And if you go out and just expect people on a park or on the street or wherever you're going to find them, on a beach, to think like you do, you're going to be very disappointed. And without good answers to their questions, and even good ways of presenting biblical truth to them, we're going to simply lose them, and they're going to think we're religious kooks that aren't in touch with the real world. And it's amazing how many times I've had people say, you know, I've always had this question. I just thought you Christians didn't have any answer. Well, I'm here to tell you we have great answers if we'll take the time to learn them. And again, let me go back again to, to, to my outline for just a second. In the Christian world or Bible school, you can just teach and preach the Bible and people don't question the truth or the veracity of what you're saying. In the secular world, they're going to question everything. And you know what? In some sense of the word, they have a right to. They don't know God. They've never seen God. That's the way I used to be before I got born again. And I needed to get some good answers to my questions. You know, let me just say this. When I first got born again, I remember a conversation with my father. My dad was an attorney. He had spent years and years in the Marine Corps. He had seen many people die in combat. He had had some real questions about God. And I remember the very first time that I ever mentioned to my father that I'd become born again. My dad asked me three or four of the very hardest questions that a person can ever be asked about their faith. And you know what? At that time, I had no answers to give my father at all. My dad surmised... <coughs> That because I couldn't answer his questions, that the Christian faith didn't have any validity. The second time my dad and I had a conversation about God, I had gotten some good answers. And he was staggered that there are good answers. He had just never heard them. <clears throat> no one had taken the time to study and to come up with answers. And we're going to go over some of these questions in our outline today. To tell someone who doesn't believe in the existence of God that God sent his son to die for them or that Jesus loves them is nonsense. And this is a dilemma for us as evangelists because God tells me to go and to preach the gospel. And the gospel is all about Jesus' life, death, burial, and resurrection. And yet they don't believe in Jesus. They don't believe in God. Now I want you to think about this. Is that a dilemma for us? Or is there some kind of a foundation that we need to lay? Listen to this. I, I've called this a distinction. Evangelism is preaching the gospel message with the intent to call hearers to make a commitment or to put their faith in Christ. Listen to this. Pre-evangelism, which is really what apologetics is, is the removal of secular people's objections to faith. My father had objections to faith. He couldn't understand how there could be such an all-powerful God and the world be so completely messed up. He'd seen so much death, so many people die in combat. And you know what, what, what really racked my father's mind? How could a good man go and die in combat and an absolute scoundrel, somebody that my father just didn't shoot, come out of combat alive? 
if there's any justice at all, if God is doing anything in this universe, why is there so much discrepancy as far as good and evil, and why doesn't God single out good people to bless and bad people to curse? But when I first heard that question, I had no real answer for him. You see, my father had an objection. For him, it was a moral objection to the existence of God. And what kind of a God would allow all these wars and all this rape and all this murder and all these problems in the world? My father couldn't, he just he couldn't believe in a God when in his mind, this becomes such a moral dilemma, and it became a stumbling block to faith, where my dad was actually raised in the church, in the Methodist church. And there was a time in his life where, where even at a Methodist camp where he went forward to give his life to God. And yet, later in life, because of what he goes through, he can't reconcile where is God amidst all this mess. You see, until I remove that objection in his heart and in his mind, he can't put his faith in God. And see, this is what apologetics, this is what answering tough questions is all about. So you see, I believe answering tough questions is the pre-evangelism necessary to get a person to a point where I can preach the gospel to them. No one will be saved until the gospel, the power of God, takes root in their hearts. And yet many times I have to uproot some of these objections or misunderstandings before that gospel can get down in their heart and make a difference. Now this is an interesting distinction, and this is the bottom of page 67. I hope you'll turn there in your manual and really see this. Evangelism has its basis in biblical proclamation and in sharing your testimony. In other words, I'm preaching the Bible, and I'm sharing what I've experienced of God that's going to make God come real to them in this generation. I'm not talking about a 2,000-year-old God and a 2,000-year-old book. My testimony brings Jesus into the day and now. But listen to this. Pre-evangelism has its basis in reason and logic. And to show why a secular objection to faith is groundless. Paul actually uses the word reasoning, when, or Luke does, when he describes what Paul did in Acts 19. He went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading. Think of that. He, he has to use his logic, his reasoning, his thinking to connect this message with people's hearts so that they can believe. For many of us, we would say, well, you have to just take it by faith. You don't need to reason with people. All that means is you're going to be content to have an awful lot of people walk away from you and you never connect with their heart. And you never uproot the, the ridiculousness, you know, for 22 years of my life, I believed in evolution until someone forced me to examine what I really believed about it. And when that was uprooted from my life, do you realize that faith in God made a lot of sense? Suppose I just told them, ah, evolution's not true. You see, I believed it was. The speculation and argument in my mind had to be dealt with before the gospel made any sense to me. I remember being taught the nebular dust hypothesis <coughs> about the origin of the universe, that swirling dust began to collide with each other and that it created electricity and static electricity that was the building blocks of life. That's completely and utterly ridiculous. No legitimate scientist in the world today really believes that anymore. That was the predominant theory in 1982 when I went to Texas Tech. I thought I understood where the universe came from. 
when somebody explained real creation to me and where and how in that sense God created the heavens and the earth and they they blew holes in my scientific theories about creation. All of a sudden, God as a creator made a lot of sense to me. Nothing in science shows us anything at all about evolution. Evolution is as much a faith or a doctrine or a religion as any other belief in the world. And yet I had never been forced to examine my presupposition as a believer in evolution. And when that happened, all of my logic came crumbling down. And then when somebody presented the gospel, it made sense to me. You see, this is what answering tough questions is all about. I want to give you some points to consider. Unbelievers have good questions. I'm going to list a few of them. How could a good God creation be such a mess? I remember one time hearing this one on the street. Do you really believe that Jonah was swallowed by a fish? How could a man live inside a fish for three days? I remember one time somebody asked me, do you really believe that Jesus was raised from the dead? Well, I do. I believe all of these things, but there was a time in my life when I had a world view that would not allow for these kinds of things. I remember my dad asking me one time, SW, that's what he used to call me, how could a miracle be possible? Miracles don't happen. Well, if there's a God, miracles could happen every day. But you see, his whole world view was a secular world view. And so it, it meant that a man couldn't be swallowed by a fish, or that Jesus couldn't be raised from the dead because we're not thinking about God. Another question I've been asked many times is, seven days, literally, really? Do you really believe that God, that there's a being out there that could create this universe in seven days? You see, in their mind, it's an impossibility. But I want you to know something. We got good answers in the Bible. And we have good answers through reason. What I was taught is that science has proven that the universe is billions of years old. Really? Really? Has science proven that? Or is that just as much a tenet of their faith as we would say that we believe the Bible? And the inspiration of the Bible is a tenet of our faith. You see, people need to be, need to have their presuppositions examined. And I tell you, if you would, if you would come to our, our apologetics training, you would get great answers to these questions. And again, I'll just say it like this. Secular people, too secular people, Christian doctrine sounds like fairy tales. A God that's invisible, that created and sustains the entire world, people getting swallowed by fishes, people raised from the dead, Jesus one day returning to the earth for someone who has all these secular presuppositions. These kind of questions seem like unanswerable. And that's something that I would, that I would say here under, under number two in points to consider. The vast majority of skeptics have only heard the questions and honestly believe we have no answers to their good questions. But let me add this. The Bible, God, and reality are on our side. It's a matter of us to take the time and to do some, some study and some learning and, and reasoning and come up with some good answers. Again, I've already read this to you in 1 Peter chapter 3. We need to always be ready to give an answer, a defense for the hope and the reason that I have faith. There's a passage in 2 Corinthians 10 that says, The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, 
but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. You know what secular arguments are? They're strongholds in secular minds that have to be pulled down before the gospel is going to penetrate their hearts. If, if we would destroy secular speculations, then people will be prepared for gospel presentations that are going to penetrate their hearts. Amen? Listen to this. I want to give you our task, and I'm back on page 71 in your outline. We're coming to a close here. We want to answer their questions. We want to remove their obstacles. And then we want to preach the gospel and call people to make a commitment. I've learned over the years that there are people that are literally one good answer away from making Jesus the Lord of their life. But they've got something they don't understand in their mind, in their heart. They don't understand. And if you and I would give them a good answer to their question, it'll make all the difference in the world. I want to give you the tough questions. And in our, in our course on apologetics, I deal with all of these. How do we know God exists? Suppose somebody were to ask you that question, how do you know beyond a shadow of doubt that God exists? What would you answer? Let me ask you something. I hear people say this all the time. You can't prove there's a God. I say, I certainly can prove there's a God. What does the, the existence of this Bible prove? Because it proves something beyond a shadow of a doubt. Someone created this. Someone bound it with leather. Someone printed out these pages. We know beyond a shadow of a doubt that this Bible proves someone put this together. It's like my wristwatch. What does this watch prove beyond a shadow of a doubt? Someone designed it. Someone executed that design. The reason it exists is because it was created. How do I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God exists? Because I see God's fingerprints on creation all the time. While we would say it's ridiculous to say this watch created itself, do you realize how ridiculous it is to say that this world or anything at all created itself? The fact that we exist proves there's a God that created us. What we're doing is we're using creation to declare the handiwork of God. Again, I get much more into this and give you a much better answer and walk you through that in our apologetics. What about evolution? This, When I was a little boy, and I mean probably first grade, my parents, my mother, bought me books on evolution. And all of my life, I thought that evolution was the answer of where mankind came from. And then, once I began to study it, when I was at Texas Tech University, I realized there is no scientific evidence for evolution at all. It literally is the artist who's drawn these different uh, links and, and, and charts. It is, it is absolutely non-founded in science. Evolution has no basis in science at all. And yet I was taught that it did my entire life. If I don't destroy the thinking of someone who believes in evolution, it doesn't make any sense to them for me to say that there's a God that created the heavens and the earth. In addition, number three here in our tough questions, I hear this one all the time. Is Jesus the only way? Are you Christians telling me that Jesus Christ is the only truth and that everybody else in the entire world is wrong? The Muslims are wrong. The Hindus are wrong. The Buddhists are wrong. Anybody else that believes in anything else is wrong. How can you believe that? 
Well, the truth of the matter is I have a great answer for that. It'd probably take a while to give it to you. But these are the questions that we need to answer. And let me just say this real quick. If God sent his son into the world to die for the sins of the world, then let's not blame Jesus if he really is the way, the truth, and the life. Now, number four, what about those who've never heard about Jesus? This is one of the questions my father asked me. Are you telling me, Stephen, that all the people in the world that have never heard about Jesus, that they're going to just be lost and going to hell? You know, that's a great question. We need to come up with a good answer. And again, what I want to do today is introduce you to apologetics. We have a great answer to that question. Number five, if God is so good, then why does so much evil exist? Do you know that right now in North America, the number one objection secular people have to God is the problem of evil. It's a true statistic. 29% of those that don't believe in God say their number one objection is all the evil, all the problems in the world. The bottom line is, I need to give those people a good answer. Number six, if I'm a good person, do I really need Jesus? I've heard this all the time. I'm a good person. I've never murdered I, I don't, I mean, they're lying when they say this about how good they are, uh, that they never lie and they never cheat and they never steal. There's no such thing. There's none good, not even one. But what we, what we need to understand is there's an awful lot of people who think they're good enough to be saved without Christ. And I'm here to tell you we need to deal with that. Number seven, and this is, this is something that I hear all the time. You know, I've tried Christianity. I've tried the church. It didn't do anything for me. Really? Did you really get born again and meet the living God? Or were you just religious? See, again, we've got good answers, and, and these answers need to be developed. Number eight, isn't Christianity just a psychological experience? Well, the answer is no, it's not. Miracles prove that. You know, when I had stage four cancer, I didn't need a psychological experience. I needed a miracle working God. When I was a drug addict and in bondage to drugs and alcohol, I didn't need a psychological experience. I needed the power of God to set me free. No, Christianity isn't just a psychological experience. But again, I need to be able to connect with that person. And, and, and give them good answers to their questions so they open their heart up to the gospel. The last thing that I've listed here in our manual is just something that we're going to be doing again. It's another whole series of trainings, but I want you to be aware of it. I call this ministering in the world of world religions. Again, this is all apologetics. And it's a different field of apologetics, the field of world religions. We're going to learn how to preach Christ and the Trinity to the different peoples in the world. When I was in Spain, I didn't know how to minister to Catholics. Once I learned how, ministering to Catholics, we saw hundreds of Catholics get born again. You know, ministering to Muslims is another whole field of ministry. Do you understand that Muslims are really prepared for God? They believe in God. They believe in Revelation. They believe that, that Jesus did come to this earth. While they're, they're messed up in some other areas, can I tell you something? There are multitudes of Muslims putting their faith in Christ today. In fact, if you get a chance, look up this on the, on the, uh, on the web, More Than Dreams. More than dreams, and you'll see how many Muslims and, and what God is doing in the Islamic world. There's ministering to Hindus. Do you realize that Hindus are also very hungry for God? And yet their worldview is completely different than ours. 
And it's going to take some, some particular ministry. Have you ever seen people with a red dot on their head? The Hindus, what are they doing? I, I've actually seen them when they cut off an animal's head, dip their finger in the blood, and put the blood on their own head. Do you realize that Hindus have a concept of sacrifice and a concept of appeasing God with blood? I'm telling you right now, they're primed for the gospel. If you were to actually preach the gospel with signs and wonders and miracles and help them understand that God isn't just so far off. Anyway, I don't have time to get into it now. I want you to understand this. People are prepared all over the world. It's up to us to do something. There's Buddhists, there's atheists, there's occultics and, and animists. Can I tell you this? If we would do our work in apologetics, people would get saved. Hey, listen, it's been great to be with you in these studies. I just want to encourage you. This lesson is to sort of whet your appetite. Let's get even more effective in our gospel sharing by doing some preparation. God bless you.